give a warm welcome to the stage, Axios senior business reporter, Hope King. Good morning, everyone. It is so great to be back here in DC. I'm excited to be back, especially for our second annual What's Next Summit. Hope you guys have been having a great time. A really quick reminder, if you are enjoying many of the conversations here, please tweet your insights and things that you want to share and follow the hashtag What's Next Summit. So I am so excited for our next guest. Uh, she leads one of the largest and most consequential companies here in the US, CVS Health. Please welcome to the stage Karen Lynch, President and CEO of CVS Health. Good morning. It's so great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So I want to just, uh, how annoyed do you get when people start questions with a, an anecdote about the store, the CVS store? Oh, you know, I don't actually get it. It's interesting. I don't get annoyed. I get um, frustrated because I'm like, how can we do better? And you can imagine um, how many emails I get a day from uh, customers that talk about our store and give me feedback. And most times it's, hey, I didn't do this or you didn't do that. And I look at it as learning opportunity. You know, what can we do different? How can we think about um, training. I actually read all the emails. Um, when I first started, they said, you're going to get a lot of emails from customers. Um, we can just block them. And I said, absolutely not. I want to see what's going on because that gives me insights. You know, and I get them from all over, from all of our businesses. And you know, that, those are some of the best training opportunities that we have. Well, I begin with that question because your business is so much bigger than your stores, even though you do have the largest presence on a, on a retail scale. Uh, but the business is only, what, one third of your overall CVS health footprint. So today, congratulations, you closed the deal on Signify. Um, why is it so important for CVS Health to expand in so many directions? Yeah, so it's a great question. So um, CVS is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year. And if you think about um, CVS consumer value stores, that's our roots. And we're really staying true to our roots. If you think about the, whole, um, the combination of all of our businesses, we're just extending, as you said, into more um, services that provide consumers value in healthcare. So if you take a step back and you look at CVS and you think about kind of someone's journey in healthcare, um, the first sort of thing that people think about when they're hurt or sick is do I have um, insurance to help me pay for that? Do I have that financing mechanism? And we have two big businesses, our Aetna business and our Caremark business that represent one third of all Americans. And so we're interacting with them to support their financing. A lot of times the next question is, how do I get my care? And what, where can I go? And um, how can I get high quality value? Well, we have those options as well. And that's through our Minute Clinic, through our specialty infusion, now with Signify Health, and uh, we have a pending acquisition with, um, with Oak Street. And then where can I sort of get that continuation of care, get that follow-up medication? Those are our, um, our stores. So if you think about what's happening in healthcare today, People are accessing healthcare in various ways. They're accessing in the home. That's why Signify. They, we, they, we've seen primary care as an underutilized um, healthcare services, so that's part of why we're extending into primary care, into the Oak Street. And then um, technology is really, um, will be the enabler of healthcare as we think about healthcare in the future. I mean, I think from business strategy, it makes a lot of sense to be that holistic provider. But a lot of your critics uh, look at the dominance expansion as potentially threatening the quality of care overall, potentially having that dominance then raise their healthcare costs, which we know are extraordinary here um, in, this, in the States compared to other countries. How do you respond to those types of fears when there's a lot of mistrust right now around huge companies. Well, what's interesting, CVS Health is one of the most trusted brands in healthcare today. And um, as we think about um, healthcare, and we have what I call our North Star, and our North Star as a company is really to improve access, improve quality, and improve service, and simplify. And, and really, I think the end game in healthcare is how do we engage consumers uh, in their healthcare? You know, it's, what's interesting, uh, it's an interesting stat. Um, with primary care, eight, only 8% 8 
of the population are really engaging in primary care today. That's costing um, $55 billion of excess healthcare costs. So, so if people started engaging more and sort of thought about uh, that engagement and you know, kept sort of that preventive healthcare, there's cost savings there. Uh, people want healthcare um, delivered differently. And so, you know, we have the ability to do that, you know, in the home, in the community, and, and digitally. So I, I think it's, you know, for us, it's about consumer engagement. It's really driving towards that North Star and making sure that we're improving the lives of Americans and improving their health. And that's really what we're trying to achieve. In the, and you need the assets to do that. Well, in that race for those assets, you were outbid by Amazon for one medical. I know Oak Street is part of that augmentation. What is the defining competitive advantage for a primary care group to join CVS Health versus an Amazon, a Walmart? You know, everyone is racing right now to provide health care for people. Well, you, well, first of all, you can't... Um believe everything you read about being outbid or whatever. So Oak Street is uh, an important asset um, for us. As we've always said, um, when we think about uh, health care and you know, moving into primary care, we really wanted to make sure we had a um, strong management team. We wanted to make sure that we were focused on uh, the Medicare population. Because what's, it, what's an important fact for, that people probably don't recognize, as you look around the corner, there is a tsunami of aging Americans. There's actually you know, more people today between the ages of 50 and 64 than there is in the Medicare population. So we were really focused you know, with Oak Street as um, kind of you know, focus on um, Medicare. And then um, you know, we said we wanted to have a strong tech staff and we wanted to make sure that you know, we could integrate it into the company. And that's how um, you know, we thought about the acquisition, you know, the pending acquisition of Oak Street. I had the opportunity to go visit one of the Oak Street clinics, you know, right down the street from our corporate headquarters. And Hope, what was interesting to me um, in that, you know, kind of visit was looking around at the engagement of that population. And there was one woman that was in the community center. And, um, and I asked her, you know, I just went up and asked her, like, you know, what do you think about Oak Street and what are you kind of doing? And she goes, I come here every day. She said, I don't have anyone, I don't have family, I'm alone. And I'm helping today with the decorations in the community center, um, but this is a place for me to engage in. I get all my health care here, but it's also a place where I feel like um, I can you know, go every day and have a place um, you know, to engage and interact with people. And that was fascinating to me. If you think about that population, mm -hmm. and you know, many people um, you know, that are elderly are suffering from loneliness, and you know, Oak Street was, a, was an answer for her. I want to come back to the topic of the aging population a little bit later in our conversation because it will be such a force of change for businesses, for the way that regulators and, and policymakers think about, um, you know, organizing, uh, you know, our world. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about competition. Mm. So, you know, okay, so you weren't outbid, I don't know, <laughs> for, for one medical, but you also have Mark Cuban with Cost Plus Drugs. I sat down with him in October and, you know, he, in his own way, uh, was going after pharmacy benefit managers. Yep. He is committed to that 15% markup. Pharmacy services for CVS made up 50% of your revenue, more than, at the end, as of the end of last year. Is that a future that you could see is doing something that Cost Plus Drugs is embarking on? You know, I think that you have to step back and say, you know, what is the, the goal and what have we been able to accomplish? You know, you, you know um, costs of healthcare are, um, you know, continuing to escalate despite kind of everyone's push. Pharmacy costs are, you know, continuing to escalate. We've seen, you know, over the course of um, the last year, uh, you know, costs of drugs in, increased by 20 to 30 um, percent. The average cost of a specialty drug is $220,000. So it is something that we are incredibly um, focused on. We don't set the prices, you know, and we manage and sort of navigate on behalf of our customers um, to make sure that we're um, getting the best um, lowest net cost for them. 
there's hope. I mean, if you think about um, you know, where the industry's going, you look at um, biosimilars, um, that is a big opportunity. There's seven or eight drugs that are coming out um, very shortly um, that will combat sort of the cost of um, Humira um, through a biosimilar. Um, Part D reform, something that we're you know, very supportive of. So that is something as a company you know, we are um, focused on. Again, what's our North Star? Our North Star is improving cost, quality, and access. Pharmacy is a piece of that. And today, as a matter of fact, um, we just issued our pharmacy drug trend report. What we found is that um, for our clients, we um, kept drug prices uh, lower than inflation. And the other thing that we saw was on a year-over-year basis, we reduced, on average, for our customers, their out-of-pocket cost um, year-over-year. So we've gotten, uh, we have got really good results uh, that demonstrate our ability um, to drive down costs. Does it provide inspiration to you at all? I mean, he's looking at a vertically integrated, you know, pharmaceutical stack. He's building a manufacturing plant in, in Texas. I mean, if you're thinking about holistic healthcare, is that a direction that CVS would ever pursue? Yeah, we're look, you know, we look at kind of the whole um, whole um, part of um, healthcare, and we look at you know kind of total cost. You can't just look at one part of the value chain. You know, we look at uh, what's the you know kind of you as a person from physical health, uh, to mental health, to um, spiritual health. How do we sort of think about holistic care and take down um, the overall cost? So yes, we're constantly innovating and thinking about new things across the entire spectrum of healthcare costs. And then we look at how they can connect with one another. Because if you think about it, and I bet if I asked anyone in this audience today, hey, are you satisfied with your interaction with healthcare? Um, Raise your hand. Yeah, see, no one. Um, so that's what we're trying to accomplish. And so would that include manufacturing then? Manufacturing. Potentially, I mean, in terms of pharmaceuticals, if you're looking at what he's we're, doing. We're looking at all kinds of innovations across everything. One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is um, I think the prevailing feeling across the country and, and around the world is this: there's a sense of tension. There's tension sort of everywhere. Um, one of the, the factors of that, of course, is the pandemic, and I don't want to dwell too much on that because I think we're tired of pandemic-related <laughs> topics. But um, one of the you know, issues that you are very passionate about is, is mental health. And you have said um, in an op-ed recently that business leaders are not taking mental health seriously enough. We talk about it, it's nice, but it's not showing up in investor presentations. It's not showing up in any really tangible metrics. And your colleagues and peers on the business roundtable, I mean, they're dragging their workers back to the office, right? I mean, you've Andy Jassy and Amazon and Dave Solomon and Goldman. And I wonder if you have conversations with them and say, look, the research shows that flexible work is what people want. So why are these policies being enacted? I think everyone, um, you know, different businesses, different um, points in time. and you know, I think what you have to think about mental health really is 50 million Americans suffer from mental health. Suicide is, you know, one of the um, top drivers of um, death and it's been increasing um, in youth. I think, you know, we, as I said in the op-ed page, we all have a responsibility um, to address um, the, the crisis uh, in America, because what I have said in the past is mental health is the collateral damage of, um, of the pandemic, and we are seeing uh, youth um, suffering uh, dramatically given, um, you know, kind of what they've gone through in the last couple months. You know, I had the opportunity to talk to um, some of the national uh, leaders of uh, youth sports, and one of the things that they've been telling me is that they have been seeing um, increasing, um, you know, people, their kids just um, talking about um, depression, anxiety to them, to their coaches. And, uh, you know, we, we have to address it in America. And the way we're going to address it is, you know, we have to improve, um, you know, people going into the profession. Um, there's not enough providers. Um, and, you know, the tele um, kind of psychiatry has helped a lot. I, you know, you've probably seen um, us talk about the numbers. Before the pandemic, we saw 9,000 uh, interactions for mental health. Now we see, you know, 20 to 30 million. There's a need. And as a country, I think we just need to address it because you've heard me say this many times, Hope, your head is connected to your body. So if your um, mental health is not where you need it to be, and it's going to impact your physical health. And we all need to, you know, kind of think about how do we um, take care of that. 
and, and we need to talk about it. You know, you, you know, and I've shared this publicly, that you know, at 12 years old, my mom died by suicide, and I wouldn't talk about it for decades. And people need to talk about it because that's how people are going to get the access and the help that they need. Um, and then, you know, if we, we just need to make sure that people are getting that, that coverage and the, the support they need to, to address it because it is addressable. And so there's a language barrier and people really understanding how to talk about their mental health and there's shame around it, I think, exactly too, right. which we don't have time for it today, um, unfortunately. Um, another big source of tension here in the States is on abortion rights. And, you know, you've got attorneys general from 21 states threatening uh, legal action. Uh, Walgreens has said that they will now stop selling abortion pill. Will CVS follow suit? Yeah, so here's what I would tell you about, um, again, I'll go back to my North Star. What is our North Star? Improve access, quality, and health for Americans. And we have been a strong proponent for many years in women's health. What we have said is that we will dispense drugs that are FDA approved where legally permissible. And as a company, you know, we've been um, supporting women's health in a variety of ways. We've extended our services in Minna Clinic to support women's health. Uh, so we're, you know, we are, this is a, an important part. Just look at the numbers with um, maternal health in America. It is um, unacceptable that a country of ours is going backwards in maternal health. We need to make sure that people and women are getting the care and the services that they need. End stop. So the threat right now, you're in a wait and see mode? Wait and see. Um, on the, the topic of, of uh, uh, maternal uh, health care too and, and paid leave, I, I think a lot about burnout. How do you manage your own mental health? How do you ensure that women in, in your workforce are able to overcome their own challenges, the pipeline to the C-suite for women, senior leader women, are, 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 it's, it's shrinking because of burnout. So let's start with how you manage your own mental health and how you might counsel other women. So I do a couple of things. I get up every morning and I'm a Peloton fanatic on the Peloton early. I do Wordle every morning sort of for that mental agility. I'm learning Polish for that mental agility. Um, I do that at night, not to my Polish. Husband. Yes, Polish. Um, my husband's like thinks I'm a little like off center, but um, learning, uh, learning that. And um, so that's what I do. And, you know, I talk about all that with our um, colleagues. I'm the executive sponsor of our women's um, uh, colleague resource group. And um, just yesterday, uh, you know, we had uh, an event a, a, to c celebrate Women's, um, it, women's International, well, International Women's mm -hmm. Month. And um, I was so inspired um, by the leaders um, talking about um, their journeys. And they, what they did was they honored um, women that were important to them. And they honored their mothers. One, they, one of them honored their, um, their daughter. And, it was interesting because there was a couple themes there. One was, and one of them inter interviewed their grandmother. And the, the theme through generational was how can we be more kind as a society? So, you know, everyone talked about that. And then the other theme was, you know, what, how can we make sure that we're, um, you know, physically and mentally fit to do the things that we need to do and to take care of ourselves. And we had a long conversation around taking care of ourselves. And the last woman had interviewed her daughter and her daughter suffered from mental health issues. And her daughter talked um, you know, very um, you know, uh, eloquently about you know, the challenges that she had. So as a company, we have those vulnerable conversations that make it okay, and then we share ideas and thoughts on how we can even get better and improve ourselves. And are you also looking at ways to improve uh, paid time off benefits for families? Yeah, we've done a, a lot of that. As you know, we've you know, increased minimum wage. We held all of our benefit costs um, flat. We've um, you know, done a lot for our employees, and we just did um, a huge investment for our frontline workers for um, appreciation bonuses, so very focused, because my philosophy is um, an engaged workforce um, is you know, supportive of our, our customers, and that's really what we need. I mean, I, I would love to see companies report on the mental health of their, I think, staff. I think that's something that I would like to report on as a company. 
ideas out there for you guys. Um, <laughs> transparency. Our ESG report is coming out. You can look at how we're, how some of the things that we're doing. Yeah, I mean, look, we have you know at Axios a, a, a bot that you know pulls uh, does a poll survey. Um, I think that's really useful. Um, when you got the call to become CEO to, for the position, you were apparently wearing a shirt that said, do your job. Which yeah, is I'm a huge Patriots fan. I know some of you, but <laughs> a huge Patriots fan. Is that also your own personal mantra, or do you have another one? Um, I have two. My, one is do your job, and, and one is um, take up space, because early on, in my career, I walked into a room and I asked where I should sit, and someone said, you should sit in the corner because women um, take up space in the boardroom. And so, um, yeah, it wasn't a pleasant experience. Um, so yesterday, my women's group, they all had t-shirts on that said, take up space, uh, all in support of you know, how we can all sort of have a voice at the table. I love that. And at which point during your career did you decide, I want to be CEO, and, and why? You know, I think, uh, I think it was, uh, I don't know if there was an ever a point, like, oh, I'm, you know, I think it was, you know, an evolving um, journey of my career and continuing to have increased uh, responsibilities and, and doing a good job at those responsibilities and, um, you know, having the conversation around what's next. We end with one fun thing. You have a very disciplined morning routine. Uh, you're on the Peloton at like 5.30, but I'm wondering if you have a guilty pleasure that you'd like to share with us, one, one unhealthy habit from the CEO and president of CVS Health. Okay, um, I love cupcakes, oh. and I share, and but I only eat frosting, and I share it with my grandson, so that's our thing. As a matter of fact, you mentioned the first day as CEO. My highlight of my day was when he came over, um, he's five years old now, and um, brought me cupcakes, and we shared frosting together. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Chocolate all the way. Karen, thank you so much for being with us today. Karen, what's up, everyone?